one thing that makes you know reference so difficult is that everybody thinks that they are yeah <laughs> you know, yeah no one, it's true yeah no one pays to come and see us and we don't like to be the center of attention but yet would anybody come and pay to see a game without a referee <laughs> Jingris. I'm Michelle Jingris, and I am so excited to be joined this week by MASL Head of Officials, Ryan Sigich. Ryan, thank you so much for joining the show. This is a weekly webcast that we're doing just to give fans a behind-the-scenes look of all aspects of MASL. So thank you very much for being my guest this week. Hey, Michelle. Yeah, how are you? Welcome to the MASL. It's good to talk to you today. It's been fun so far. Um, okay, so you wear many hats in general, but with MASL, uh, you are the head of officials. You've been the head of officials since 2011. You started officiating indoor soccer in 1999, though. So I want to begin with that, with your just evolution as an official to now the head of officials. Um, and just talk me through that a little bit. What's been this process? What's this process been like for you? Yeah, it was really interesting because, you know, I, I started and I think just like the players and the coaches in this league do. I mean, you all obviously you start from outdoor and, you know, myself as a player just began uh, refereeing at a very young age like a lot of folks do. But then um, I don't know, there was just a passion for the excitement of the indoor game, you know, the speed of it. I actually um, worked at an indoor uh, facility in high school. So, you know, that kind of got me uh, closer to the game. And it's, it's just, a, for me, it's a more exciting game than outdoor. Um, I think overall for everyone, but especially for uh, the referees too. And, um, you know, I started uh, going, driving up to Wichita in Kansas City in, you know, 1999 um, as a young uh, referee then with the uh, NPSL, which was one of the major uh, professional indoor leagues at the time. And, you know, just kept on plugging away, kept doing it. It was interesting then in 2011 when the USL took over, um, which was the MISL at that time. Uh, they were looking for a head of officials. Um, Herb Silva, real familiar name within, you know, the referee world community at the time, you know, recommended me as well as, um, you know, some other folks, actually Keith Tozer and uh, Kevin Healy, both still involved in, in our league now, um, you know, recommended me as, as well. The USL was, you know, familiar with me uh, as a referee and, um, uh, as an assigner. So here we are, I guess, nine, 10 years later. Well, what was that like for you initially, just starting out, you know, when you got that phone call and you got asked to be part of this league? I mean, were you apprehensive at first or was that something that you felt like you were ready to do? You know, I was apprehensive at first, just from the standpoint that, well, you know, first of all, I didn't want to come off the field at that time. So, you know, I talked to the folks at, at uh, the USL and that was my first question. Well, do I have to stop uh, refereeing on the field? And they said, well, no, uh, absolutely not. So I kind of look at it, you know, maybe like a player coach uh, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that just the amount of pressure uh, on myself making that transition was, you know, quite a bit more. Um, you know, how can you kind of lead a group? Your, your kind of realm and um, acceptable level of mistakes, I think is quite a bit uh, fewer than, than <laughs> others. The um, accountability aspect, you know, not just to yourself, but you know, to everybody else, to the league in general, makes it a little bit more, not a little bit, but a lot more difficult in my opinion. Um, overall, I think I've been able to navigate that pretty well though. You know, I wear some other leadership paths too within mm -hmm. uh, the referee community. So, and it, and, and it all really ties together. Everything kind of complements each other. Yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit more because I think what you're alluding to is that you also deal with like assessing of referees, the assignments of referees, and just like the overall education. Is that what you you mean about some of the other responsibilities that kind of fall under your purview? Yeah, quite. Yes, exactly. I mean, us soccer uh, referees, we're pretty much involved with every aspect of the game, you know, that there is. So I'm involved, um, you know, real heavily with uh, U.S. soccer um, and we don't call ourselves assessors anymore. Were uh, referee coaches. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, we've always been assessors, but they kind of changed that, you know, lingo there, um, as well okay. as, you know, working a little bit with uh, PRO, um, the U.S. Youth uh, Soccer. I run their uh, championship events, which is a great uh, recruiting ground, um, you know, as well to, to be able to see uh, up and comers. And then I'm also the national coordinator of officials for the NCA. So, in fact, I just got back from Santa Clara where uh, Florida State just won another championship for the Division One women. So that was exciting out there. 
That's nice. Not a bad place to be in the winter right now. Uh, Santa Clara, California. That's yeah, not too shabby. Yeah. Um, okay, so you mentioned the the unique kind of uh, position that you're in where you didn't have to leave the field entirely, but you're also still overseeing in this role where you're kind of, like I said, watching everyone. So right. when you do coach, um, what are you looking for? And when you're on the field, when you have your fellow referees with you, are, are you trying to kind of teach as you go in those situations? Or is that one of those things where you guys are just there to do your job at that point and then you kind of regroup after? No, it is teach as you go, especially for myself. And, you know, we have a tenured list um, of officials too. So I think it, if if you take our, um, you know, most tenured, you know, five, six or seven uh, referees, it is, I would refer to it and, and I do is um, uh, on the job training. Okay. You know, we have a communication headset. So, you know, we can easily, you know, give advice to a new, um, you know, to somebody new that doesn't have as much experience, maybe it's their first season, you know, help with, with uh, positioning, um, you know, mechanics, correct calls, how to get a better angle, stuff like that. Mm, very interesting. And you mentioned the headsets. And so I have to ask you about, you know, we talk so much about ways to grow the game. And you, in the beginning of this, when we first started the show, you were mentioning why indoor soccer is, is kind of more exciting to you or more compelling than some of the other leagues that you've covered before. So I actually want to ask you about that in a second. But when it comes to growing the game in general, there's been a lot of talk about trying to get referees involved in all different sports. We're seeing it more and more, you know, miking up players, miking up coaches, miking up referees. Would that be something that you would be interested in with indoor soccer? Because it would kind of give fans like a way to lift the curtain a little bit and get behind your thinking a, a bit. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I would definitely be interested in, in doing that. I think it would be, um, you know, educational for fans, players, coaches, you know, to kind of hear our thought process, our uh, communication. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think it would be also just, you know, kind of exciting to understand, especially if it's a call that determines something that has to deal with just, you know, the, the outcome of the game. I think that it could be really interesting for everyone to kind of just get an idea of just what the thought process was uh, going into that. And, and for you, that's another question that I have is how do you assess the severity? I know with soccer in general, I mean, you're kind of, you're watching the theatrics a little bit as well. Um, how do you assess the severity of a foul and determine when or when you don't want to pull a card? How do you process that? Sure. So, you know, there's a few considerations as we call them, you know, the term actually comes from, from uh, FIFA that we follow. And, you know, the number one thing I think is um, the safety of the players. It all comes down, you know, to that when uh, determining, is it just a foul? Is it a foul with a strong verbal warning? Is it a foul plus a card? Um, you also have, we have the dynamic indoor where we can call like a major, quote, major penalty, almost sort of like hockey, where it's a blue card plus a yellow card. So it's a seven minute penalty on top of it so you know we have kind of another tool there in our um, toolbox but you know the first thing that we look for and determine is you know what's the point of contact so you know the lower the point of contact is um on the body if it's on you know the foot or the shoe that's not as severe as if it's um above the ankle you know ankle uh, uh, um, achilles that becomes um you know a more severe contact and then you kind of judge what the speed of it is of a player coming from a distance into a tackle or a challenge uh, intensity, the uh, amount of force, uh, you know, that's involved. All that is really taken into uh, consideration. Um, you know, we don't have the players don't have uh, cleats or studs in indoor. So we have a little bit of a greater threshold, I would say, than what you would see outdoor. So there is a little bit more, I'll call it, you know, my term is a little bit more um, of an edge to the indoor game where I think some clear 100% um, red cards, what you would see outdoor, you know, due to a studs tackle, we go a little bit lesser uh, severity on, on those, you know. But okay. basically the considerations on that are pretty much, um, you know, the same. Is it a straight leg or a bent leg if, if you're looking at, at an elbow, is it um, an elbow cock, you know, versus a straight arm? Was it to the head versus the chest? The same considerations are there as we talk about with uh, the outdoor game. And tell me a little bit, you know, just for those who maybe don't 
know just from a field perspective the the ranking system in a sense uh, of referees because I know you have two on the field and then you have two that are off field officials as well. So just quickly go through how everyone's role kind of differentiates from one another. Yeah, there's two referees on the field. They both have equal power to make calls, make decisions, give cards, not give cards. Um, there is one official that is assigned as more or less, you know, the leader. We call it the crew chief, um, just like the other um, sports are. And then we have an assistant uh, referee and a uh, fourth official that is off the field. So just like uh, outdoor, pretty much. And how else how, is VAR similar to this as well in indoor soccer as it is with outdoor soccer now? And, and if so, how has that changed things or helped things um, in this league? Well, good question. We have no VAR at this point um, okay. or video <laughs> review in, in indoor. So it, it becomes, um, it makes things more difficult. I mean, technology, I think, in general, in all sports has helped, but it's also made Free's job, I think, much more difficult uh, at the same time. It's like a double-edged sword. So if if you think about it, you know, Michelle, if you have to look at a play and slow it down and go frame by frame to determine if the call was correct or not, then, you know, is it really a bad call? Um, because I think it's a point that, you know, you got to keep in mind that uh, as a referee, you know, we have to make calls immediately and we have to look at a play in real time at game speed, you know, one angle, um, I say we don't get to do uh, a do-over on it because we don't. And you have everyone else, including coaches and players at the time, you know, they can look up at, at uh, the replay board. And it's really tight judgment calls in real time. And sure, it's a lot easier when you can look at a replay even once from a different angle, uh, from the up high. So it just makes it extremely hard. And then, you know, you throw in kind of the human element with it where I would say, you know, the vast majority of our complaints and, 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 and I think in all sports comes from, um, you know, a team that thinks they got up, that, that gets upset where they think they got the raw uh, end of the deal. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they think it was something that cost them the game or, uh, you know, something like that. And, you know, yeah, there, there, there's going to be bad calls. I mean, we see it every week in the EPL or every Sunday in the NFL. You know, these are billion dollar leagues that really, I think, have the same... Um, challenges the same issues with officiating as what um, our league does. Um, you know, I watch a lot of hockey, you always hear, why was that a penalty? Why was that, yeah. you know, not one? So it's, yeah. it's the same challenges with officiating. So, so that being said, what's your checks and balances system with your crew of referees that, you know, if there's a questionable call or if there's something that people are talking about a few days after a game, is that something that even internally, you go back and kind of look at to see if maybe you, you guys got the right call or even if it's just something you guys are doing is just constant communication to make sure you're you're looking for the right things. Yeah, absolutely. It's standard pra practice for uh, a referee to go back um, and watch the game again, you know, look at the call. Sometimes, you know, we'll go look at it at halftime. Just to, it's like you think you made the right call, but you need that um you have the confidence in it but you just need that other look at it or you want to get a second look at something like oh you know i, I thought i should have pulled a card there but i just didn't see it right let's check it at halftime but you know definitely uh after the game especially in my row i probably clipped you know 25 clips just from the few games that we had this past <laughs> weekend so but i think my key elements in my opinion are what are those game critical things um that have a direct outcome on the game so you know, major rules error. I mean, we can't have a rule error. Um, you know, the, the missed calls, um, the ones that can be debated, I think, one way or the other, where if I send the clip out, you know, the 10 referees or 10 coaches and I get the answer five versus five, you know, is that really um, a, a game critical call? You know, no, probably mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. um, so by the nature of it, I mean, we're making, you know, 50% of the people involved aren't going to like a call and you got, you know, 15 guys, you know, screaming at you. It's, as you well know, because you're very experienced in, in soccer, it's um, subjective. It's not, you know, black and white. Yeah. We work in these right. kind of, you know, my friend Howard Webb uh, calls it the shades of gray. I kind of steal that line from him yeah. um, because everything in soccer, unlike a lot of other sports, it's just so gray area yeah and, i know, think the one thing that makes you know reference so difficult is that everybody thinks that they are yeah <laughs> you know, uh, yeah no one, it's true 
yeah, no one pays to come and see us, and we don't like to be the center of attention, but, yeah, would anybody come and pay to see a game without a referee? So, so I mean, just to, to kind of echo that a little bit, I do think that's why it could be so interesting to have some sort of version or variation at certain games where you mic up a referee just to kind of just get inside the mind of what they're thinking when they go through the decision-making process that they do in, in the moment. Um, yeah. For you, the speed of indoor soccer, would that make it even increasingly difficult to make those calls in the moment? Like maybe you could benefit from video review just based on the fact that that game moves very quickly. Uh, yes, you're spot on with that comment. Indoors, that's what makes indoor soccer uniquely a little bit more challenging is the speed um, of the game. Not so much the speed of the players, um, but the speed of the game. Because if you think about it outdoor where advantage is big, if I think about that advantage decision as as long as I have outdoor to think about it, if I take that along uh, that amount of time indoor, then you know the play is going to be a third of the way down our field. So the decision making process indoor, you know, has to go much much quicker than what it does um, outdoor. You have the boards, you have you know the players uh, hitting against the boards. There's a much um, much more contact indoor than what we see outdoor and that becomes difficult in judging you know was it a foul uh to what level of a foul was it and you know we also try to keep the game flowing i mean nobody wants right. to come and you know buy a ticket to watch a game where there's constant whistles you know for fouls so we try to balance um you know the atmosphere and the temperature of the game um depending on how many fouls we're going to call depending on how much control we feel that as a ref we we have to have um, on the game, you know, things start getting heated and stuff, um, more contact, then we're going to have to, you know, blow the whistle uh, a little bit more to keep things under control. Mm -hmm. Is the speed of the game one of the reasons why you find indoor soccer so exciting, though? Because you were telling me, you know, initially that that this league is very exciting for you to officiate. So is that one of the reasons as well? And, and what else? Why else? Yeah, I mean, I think for me personally, it's, uh, you know, the speed of, of uh, the indoor game. Um, I've always been a hockey fan, too. And, you know, there's a lot of correlations between the game of yeah. hockey, um, I believe. In but, you know, including, having... including the fact that sometimes you play on uh, what was once a hockey rink. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is true, yeah. So, yeah. 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 yeah the, I mean, the, the fact on the side as well, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the speed of it is one thing that's exciting to you. The, the the correlation, I guess, with hockey as well. Anything else that stands out about this indoor game that just keeps drawing you in and bringing you back year after year? I mean, you know, the number of goals, um, you know, the lopsided. And you can have a game that you think um, it's a five-goal difference and then how quickly this game can change. Um, you know, we can't let our guard down as an indoor uh, referee because, you know, the game can change instantaneously. And exciting for fans as well. Um, so, okay, let's talk a little bit about there's a lot of new rules this year. So, first of all, how does that affect you? What's the trickle down effect when you're kind of trying to teach those rules also to your crew as well, and as well as kind of implement them in real time? And what impact have you seen them have uh, so far? Yeah, you know, so I, I think this league historically um, has changed rules kind of you know willy-nilly um i'll call it that and i think you know rule changes if we're going to change the rule i think it should we need to clearly define what the objective is like what we're trying to improve and what we're trying to make better so i think that's number one is any rule change should make the game better make the product better make it more uh entertaining make it easier uh to sell tickets number two i mean i think it should make the referee's job easier as well um you know his Looking back at the big one uh, for this year, which is uh, the goalkeeper uh, possession rule, I think generally everybody just felt that the ball went back to the goalkeeper way too much. So that's the objective of this rule. That was the issue that we're trying to change or trying to fix, trying to get the ball to go forward more. Not It's really the offensive mindset, I would think, you know, let's go uh, towards the goal. And it was felt, you know, with the leadership of uh, the league that it was felt that it's going to make the product better, make the game better, make the players better. What I've learned, um, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, the futsal game. Um, but what I have found with this role is as a referee, it creates quite a bit more focus that you have to pay attention to. 
because once the goalkeeper releases that ball, one was it by foot where they can't get it back, or one was it by hand where they can get it back once. And then we saw a game the other day in Utica where there was 11 passes and the ball finally came back to the goalkeeper. And, you know, the referees were on top of that and made that call right. But it was probably 45 seconds later. So keeping that focus on can the goalkeeper get the ball back for that long a period of time after that many passes, after we had gone up into the other side of the field, is really could, can be challenging. What has the reception been like on the field just from these rule changes or variations from players and coaches so far? Has it seemed to be well-received? I would say yes. It's really been a non-issue. It's only been called three times in five games okay. so far. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So last year, obviously, the league shut down. I talked about this a little bit with Keith last year, right before the postseason. So there's a lot of excitement and buildup heading into this season as you guys kind of start getting rolling. From your perspective, what are you most excited about and, and looking forward to as the season progresses? Well, I think, you know, from my perspective, um, I'm excited about the new leadership uh, of the league. Um, the This has always been a very good, exciting uh, professional league. But just, you know, some of the things that are coming to the table now, um, from my own uh, perspective, you know, we got a very qualified, capable, experienced group of uh, referees, you know, who actually really care about it to a very high level. And if you look at our core group, I mean, we've got 15 or 16 that – either have current or previous officiated in uh, Major League Soccer. So we've got a great group. I'm excited about, you know, additional resources, potentially going to that uh, VR, I'll call it video review, because I don't see us having another individual <laughs> okay. um, to it. Um, but, you know, being able to uh, do some things, be, do some, some um, additional training and get some new uh, referees in. Yeah, very exciting times all around. Seems like lots of opportunities right now in indoor soccer. Ryan, thank you so for much sure. for just this educational session. It was great to learn a little bit more and kind of just get into your mind and think about what you what you see on the field. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely, anytime. Guys, and again, welcome you... to the MASL, Michelle. Oh, thank you. Very nice of you. Thank you very much. And you can catch me every week, every Wednesday, uh, right here, MASL Midweek with Michelle Jingers. See you next time.